So this talk is actually going to be one of my favorite things, its perspective. Um, and it kind of ties kind of the day together. <clears throat> and we start off with a story of six blind men uh, discovering an elephant and kind of taking a look at it for the first time, right? So the first person, the first blind man feeling the trunk declares that it must be a snake. And the second, standing by the flapping ear, says that it must be a fan. The third, grasping the trunk, declares that this must be a spear, or the tusk, sorry, tusk being a spear. The fourth, wrapping his legs around the leg, uh, wrapping his legs, his arms around the leg, says that it must be a tree trunk. And the fifth touches the side of the beast and says that this must be a wall. Finally, the sixth, feeling the tail, describes it as a rope. I think that many people, when they start discovering and exploring um, EBPF for the first time, kind of feel like these blind men. They're confused by how many things that EBPF can apply to, right? It's just a huge field. I mean, we've, we've heard um, everything from how to handle, how to use this for networking, how to use it for security, how to use it for profiling, how to use it for application tracing. It's just, I mean, this is the reason why a lot of people call these things Linux superpowers, right? It just it sort of applies to everything in the space. We even got questions about who should care about it, and the answer seems to be everyone. Yeah, pretty much everyone. Yeah, sorry, everybody is the answer. So taking these kind of uh, taking these one at a time, the first one that we're going to talk about is uh, an SRE. So <clears throat> for the SREs among you with responsibility for keeping clusters running smoothly, EBPF is all about that large and growing set of powerful tools that make that are available off the shelf, ready and waiting to help you solve a problem that you can't solve with other means or with or without the rich context that EBPF can provide you. At a recent EBPF summit, I actually helped host that. Um, Brendan Gregg, who's one of the authors of the BPF trace work and a lot of the kind of surrounding area, gave a talk on getting started with EBPF observability. And he had a great slide in that that said, think like a sysadmin, not like a programmer. <clears throat> and his point, I think, was that you don't have to get into the low level details of EBPF and how it is implemented, or even write your own BPF code. Just think of eBPF as a set of additional additional tools that you can make use of right away. I mean, like one of the things that we just saw Kyle presenting on was how to kind of build eBPF trace programs and those sorts of things, right? So for a lot of the time when we talk about like one of the biggest superpowers that a lot of people are using, it's about context. SREs love context. <laughs> it's one of the it's one of the things that puts a light on in the darkness, and being able to actually access that context with simple tools like BPF trace is a pretty powerful thing, you know? It really, it really moves the ball forward. The next up, the next blind person that we're speaking of is, is, the, is the app developer, right? And what are they interested in? They're interested in debugging tools, they're interested in libraries, they're interested in flexibility, they're interested in that portability of, of tools that you don't have to write every single time. For most, for most, app, developer, blah, blah, blah. For most app developers, like SREs, the low-level details of eBPF are probably not super interesting unless you're developing eBPF code. <clears throat> but the context that eBPF can provide them, right? Like being able to instrument your application automatically, like we saw in the talk from Liz Rice talking about how leveraging BPF, we're starting to kind of approach the same sort of technology that we see in, in typically in service meshes, right? To be able to auto-instrument an application without making changes be able to understand what that application is doing at runtime without actually instrumenting the application code itself, right? Pretty amazing stuff that we can actually, I mean, just some of the stuff that we can do. And I think that that would be very attractive to developers. The other benefit of eBPF for application developers is that they no, are no longer constrained to write code in user space, which means that like, like that talk that we saw or a, a paper that recently came out, basically making things like memcache available so that when a, a system call that makes a, a call to memcache shows up, we just basically grab that system call and throw it directly to the memcache daemon, right? Like shortcutting the whole networking process entirely and making, memcache, making that local memcache daemon something that you could deploy alongside all of the applications in a, in a, in a container orchestration system like Kubernetes. Pretty amazing stuff. Um, one of the very first things that I saw 
that really blew my mind and I think will probably impress most application developers was uh, an effort to basically allow for applications to use TLS or to, be, or to use some sort of TLS authentication method without actually making any changes to the code. Again, this is one of those things where we see service mesh is really kind of taking storm, but I've seen this using eBPF with a Kafka topic, right? It's pretty amazing stuff. Like you can do, you can, you can do, uh, you can kind of change the behavior of that application at runtime without the application even being avail being, being around, uh, aware of it, right? And, 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 in, and in so doing, reduce the burden on your application developers and give them even more security, more features, more functionality, being able to deliver more of that functionality more, uh, much faster. I think I'm going to talk about the next blind man here, the uh, and uh, not always so blind, um, but from the perspective of the security professional, right? And we, we heard this um, in several of the talks, but uh, particularly from uh, Eric and Melissa at Apple, right? EBPF is really exciting. They're probably one of the one of the profiles of people that gets most excited about EBPF because the ability to attach probes like, throughout the kernel anywhere they want and see what's going on from syscalls to, um, to network packet processing, you know, that means that they can actually monitor in, in real time everything that's going on in a cluster and, um, and, and use that to baseline normal behavior um, and um, you know, information you can use to define policies. So we saw that with um, Marga Mantarola's talk where she uh, monitored the syscalls that were happening and used that to automatically generate a set comp policy. I mean, how brilliant is that? I mean, the problem that most of the security professionals have is just not knowing what policies to define. Now we can use eBPF to tell us or suggest what policies should um, be applied in the, in the cluster. Um, and then, of course, you actually have the power to enforce these policies using eBPF as well. Um, so, uh, you know, or detect anomalous behavior and alert on it. And you, you saw um, in the, the work with the eBPF-based uh, Linux uh, security module, uh, the KPC and Leo Donato showed, you know, we, we saw how, um, you know, that could really get down at the, the lowest levels of the Linux kernel to inf enforce policies that you, you wanted um, uh, applied across the system. Or, um, you know, a slightly different take on this, Mauricio showed us how we could do that specific to system D. So when you start up system D, you can create um, with, on a, just a command line parameter saying, well, which, which type of file systems should a, a particular system D module be able to, um, to access. So some really exciting things there. And, and really crucial to this working and being viable um, because this, you know, it needs to actually work in production. <laughs> it needs to be acceptable to the operators, the people that are trying to make these clusters work is the fact that eBPF enables these capabilities with a very low overhead, right? So, so you can deploy it in production, enforcing these policies without having some kind of you know, massive performance um, hit. And, um, you know, and, and, it, and part of how it does that is, is getting closer to the hardware as well. And, you know, Liz talked about how, um, you know, some eBPF programs could even be put down as, as, as onto the network hardware. And, and Dave mentioned that as well. So, so you really can get kind of realistic host-based denial of service um, enforcement, whereas previously you could only do denial of service on some kind of dedicated um, you know, big iron firewall box. Now you can put it in more places in the network. These, these kind of things are super exciting for security. I'm definitely seeing security crop up as a forensics analysis piece as well. I mean, we've yeah. talked about gathering all this context and getting it off of this, getting into a data lake and those sorts of places. I mean, that's definitely a place where I, where I see that coming up, whether it's just network forensics, whether it's application forensics, what were the command line, you know, like, what, did you see a process start after the actual running process of the container? Like, being able to provide that information Absolutely. has been super yeah. helpful. Um, Duffy talked about uh, application developers, but there's another type of developer as well. You know, the, the kind of maybe more rarefied era of the, of the kernel developer, um, you know, and and for these folks, you know, eBPF actually is an opportunity as well. It gives them the opportunity to develop and release new features without having to wait for the upstream kernel community to merge what they're, they're working on. So you might think, well, you know, eBPF is for enabling people that, that aren't the ones working on the core of the kernel, but 
I, th I think you know that that's a mistake. And the, even the, for the folks who are developing on the kernel, there are going to be things where it makes sense to release it in eBPF instead of get instead of pushing um, changes upstream. And be, because that whole process just takes years and years and years, right, to get um, not just get merged into upstream, but then get into all of these downstream distros, and then get deployed into um, you know, re real world, um, uh, you know, real world networks, and 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 that that process gets um, you know can get bypassed. So it enables them now to innovate at the same speed as application developers, and you know it was one of the points that I talked about at the at the beginning of, the, of today. Um, you know, and things like eBPF iterators. You know, we're getting we're getting all of these new capabilities, and Alban um, Greki talked about uh, you know how. Uh, he's been leveraging eBPF iterators to, to create richer capabilities with the eBPF programs that he's writing. And so, you know, th there's a lot of exciting things happening in eBPF for, for these um, kernel developers. And um, you know, th the other way of looking at it as well is not just that the traditional kernel developers are now able to do more, it's also that folks who've maybe traditionally been more on the application development side now can start to think of themselves as kernel developers. Um, you know, th th they're able to actually it enhance the capabilities of the kernel with these um, eBPF programs that they're um, developing. And, uh, you know, I thought the, the last talk that we had, you know, Kyle went through a whole load of the different libraries available to people, really kind of showed how it's accessible now with these libraries that are, that are out there for people to um, develop these new kernel capabilities. We also see the kernel um, being able to iterate and innovate yeah. so that even before they make a commitment to do something multiple years to get it into all those downstreams, we see a way that they can run tests, they can run ideas and see if there is uh, engagement or, um, or a need for that in, in talking in product terms, if there's a customer and market fit for what they're trying to think about. So there's another group that we work, we believe are very important in this, and that's an infrastructure architect. These, from this perspective, eBPF pro provides a whole new set of tools and building blocks when you're creating clusters, specifically Kubernetes clusters, but also more generically. We've seen a lot of work around Kubernetes today, but uh, an example of this would be getting your own CNI um, that is an eBPF CNI for Kubernetes, and Sky talked about that when they said that they'd selected that and were using that in their Kubernetes clusters. So there's lots of um, advantages for infrastructure architects. The core elements of the architecture become programmatic and programmable. So this is, again, infrastructure as code, but with a new lens on it as well. And it allows us, with that, that ability to program it, to evolve it over time, watch what happens, make test cases, and go ahead and deploy and uh, make changes so that they are, uh, can be introspected over time, as well as can be engaged with um, more as you're making test cases. Of course, one of the other super important pieces, there's tons of flexibility, but there's also performance. And this is the thing that anyone who talks about over observability has concerns about. You have to be very efficient when you're instrumenting something. We saw a talk today about running instrumentation in prod, like go look at what's happening in prod. How many people have been in tech long enough to never do that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's me. I have been in tech long enough to never run tracing and prod, but now there's a way, apparently. And we also heard from Dave Thaler where eBPF is becoming an enabler for the common architecture across multiple platforms, and it is becoming the common architecture across platforms. We heard also about core and how that is, again, there's a long lead time to get these things in, but there are ways that we're getting there, and that all of this work is really being broadened. So it's not just a Linux technology. It's coming to Windows, it's coming to other operating systems, and an infrastructure architect will no longer need to worry if eBPF programs would be need to be created for multiple architectures. We're seeing that go to a, a single architecture. So architecture, infrastructure architects, very important. And then we get to my absolute favorite topic of the world, and that's 
all of you, which is the community of EBPF. So thank you for participating. Thank you for being here. Thank you for asking questions and listening and learning. And thank you for taking what you've learned here today out into the world and inviting and engaging and welcoming others into this community. Because that is the most important part of open source, in my opinion. Starting with a community, starting with a small group of experts and insiders creating something really neat, really compelling, and then that group gets bigger, and then that group gets bigger beyond that. And then we start seeing the industry take notice. We've had the formation of the EBPF Foundation in the last six months. And we've had the EBPF summits, and now we have an EBPF, um, a cloud native EBPF day. Let me be clear. All of this is promoting adoption. All of this is promoting growth. All of this is teaching people about what we think is so cool. So we're here to work with you all to become advocates for EBPF, to talk about it, to be excited about it, and to share that excitement so that we can continue to grow in this way. Because as a tech, it's pretty impressive. One other thing, all the projects we talked about today are open source. Please feel free to jump in. Please feel free to contribute. And let me be clear, contributing is not just by code. You can contribute by running your own eBPF summits. You could contribute by trying to help someone think through an architectural problem. You could contribute by pointing a newbie in the Slack channel, which is, of course, slack.ebpf.io to get registered. You could point a newbie in the Slack channel to some documentation and answer a super simple question. You could ask a super ask a super difficult question. All of these things are contributing to the community. All of these things are growing the group that is involved with eBPF, expanding the ways that the idea of eBPF as a platform can be used and engaged with. We really hope you all will join us. You've taken yeah. a great first step. Indeed. I, mean, I, I, completely, I completely echo everything that, that Sarah said, and one thing I would bring it back to is what we started this, this, this particular presentation with, which is perspective, right? When you're involved in the open source project, when you see somebody ask a question that you know the answer to, you're bringing your perspective to the problem, and that in itself is a huge contribution, right? It's not about whether you can, you know, whether you know the answer to some complicated BPF loop that is that is messing somebody up. It's about whether you can bring a fresh perspective, a fresh set of eyes, whether you can listen to the question and hear something in the question that nobody else heard, right? That is a huge contribution to any open source project. And being welcoming in that, because yeah. the, the conversations that hurt a community most are the ones that shut down something for being too basic or shut down something for, you know, we argued about that six months ago, never mind. Um, but going ahead and being welcoming, being engaging, and trying to share your excitement about eBPF. Because all of you got out of your houses, most of you probably rode a plane to get here, and then all of you are sitting here for whatever it's been, nine hours now, in a face mask. And that's that's got to be some excitement driving yep. you. So. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us today for the first Cloud Native EBPF Con, EBPF Summit Day. Cloud Native EBPF Day. Thank you, Cloud Native EBPF Day. Either of you have more to say? Yeah, I, I would like to just add um, one thanks to yeah. what, what you said, which is, you know, I think this, this would not have happened without a lot of work by a lot of people, mm. uh, many of whom thank are in you. this room, um, but one in particular, I think he's still in this room, Dan Pop. Is, Oh, okay. So he's not he's not here, so that's all right. We can we can talk behind his back. But even behind his back, I would say, you know, this this day was, you know, very much down to him. He he produced the initial momentum that got it off the ground. Um, and you know, a lot of folks from uh, Lexi helped Lindsay at um, CNCF. Um, you know, it was it was really a, a big group effort. And you know, thank you for coming in and, and, and you know sharing you. that with us today. Yeah. Thank you all yeah. to all of the speakers. Enjoy and your you week. All.